He went from cross-examining witnesses to crisscrossing the world in search of the perfect cocoa. It is the case of a lawyer turned chocolate maker. I'm Mike Schneider, and this is Venture. All right, we welcome you to Venture once again, the world of small business and big ideas. This time around, we're going to introduce you to Sean Askinosi, the founder of Askinosi Chocolate. Every drop of the river is hot melted chocolate of the finest quality. This trip to the chocolate factory started in the courtroom. Ew. He was a criminal defense attorney, but traded in defending accused killers for a much sweeter job. After two first-degree murder cases back-to-back -back within a four-month period, I needed to do something else. And so I searched and searched, and eventually, after five years of praying, chocolate came to me. Sean Askinosi took his savings and a $1.5 million bank loan to open his chocolate factory in a rehabilitated downtown Springfield, Missouri loft. Now he buys cocoa from farmers in Mexico, Ecuador, and the Philippines. He features those farmers prominently on his packaging and shares his profits with them. It's a recipe that's catching on. In just under two years, Askenazi chocolate can be found on the shelves of the Food Emporium in New York, Whole Food stores in Colorado, and the chocolate has cultivated a following from Singapore to Sweden. From prison bars to chocolate bars, Charlie would agree. That's the golden ticket. Sean Askinosi is here with us right now. This is a fascinating story. There you are engaging in, in the legal career of significant importance, capital cases. And, yet, and you, you turn your, your, well, I shouldn't say it that way. Did you turn your back on it for any particular reason? Mike, there really wasn't one reason. It was sort of a culmination. I mean, I spent almost 20 years in the criminal defense world, lots of courtroom, lots of high stress, high profile, a lot of pressure, death threats. And so it just sort of culminates. And what ultimately happened for me is I just kind of lost my passion for it. I needed something else. This, it's fascinating. It's a wonderful success story. And there's so many things about doing well and doing good at the same time, which we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, but had you had any experience at all in dealing with chocolate or candy or, or food? When this came to me, I had absolutely no idea where chocolate came from. I did not know that it came from a bean. I didn't know that it came from the equator regions of the world. Um, but after a couple of murder cases, you know, I needed a hobby, so I started cooking. You know, like a lot of guys, I was grilling outside. Before that, I couldn't make a Pop-Tart, and my wife would <laughs> attest to that. And so I just started from there, and then I started baking. And baking, I sort of became obsessed with cupcakes. I mean, I've made thousands of cupcakes, and that's what led me to the chocolate desserts. And then from the chocolate desserts to actually making chocolate. Did you, what, what was the first time you ever made chocolate? I made chocolate in May, June, 2005 at home in my kitchen. Did you go out and buy the cocoa beans or? I bought the cocoa beans online and learned how to do it online and it made a complete mess and it took, it took me about a week just to make a pound of chocolate. Mm -hmm. But at, you know, from that point and really even before that point, before I'd made it, I knew, I mean, this was a passion that I really felt like I, I could get into and spend a long time with. Had you at that point put together a business plan in your mind at least or on paper? In the in the very, very beginning, I didn't know for sure it was going to be a business. I mean, it kind of started as a hobby. But by the end of that summer, I'd traveled to the Amazon to learn about how cocoa is harvested, where it comes from, how to influence flavor. Then I put together a business plan. And uh, I didn't I didn't have, I don't have investors. I didn't need a business plan for the bank. But it was just absolutely key. And I tell students that when I travel around and speak. I don't care what you're doing. If you're going to start a business, please put together a business plan. I still have a business plan. Now, you went to the bank for, what, one and a half million? Is that correct? Well, ultimately, uh, you know, since the inception of the business, we've borrowed around three quarters of a million. Mm -hmm. And then I've put in myself about $700,000. When, and you, when you went to the bank to borrow, what did they say to you? Well, this bank... I was to say, you're a lawyer. You're a lawyer who's right. making chocolate now. Well, well here, take. At, the, at the point I went to the bank, I mean, I have a, I had a 15-year history with this bank as a lawyer, and huh. they'd known me for a long time. It's a small local bank, and they just said, 
Uh, we know where to okay, find you. Yeah, we know where to find you. And at that point, I was still practicing law. I was doing both for a while. What were you going to use the money for? I mean, did you have at that point figured out uh, the equipment that you were going to need, yes. or uh, the space you were going to need? Both. In fact, um, you know, we had very specific needs for the capital: equipment, inventory, and real estate. So I bought the building in Springfield. It Springfield, was a, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri. It was a 100-year-old building. When we bought it, it had. Uh, no electrical, no plumbing, and in some cases just a dirt floor. So we refinished. Oh, sounds that whole like thing. a natural, right? <laughs> oh yeah, perfect. You know, my wife was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" But, but you know, that's that. That was the thing. We wanted to be in that part of town. It's a part of town that's sort of blighted. There's a nearby homeless shelter, and I wanted to be a part of the revital, revitalization of the community. So that, but that's what we use the money for. Yeah, the, the equipment. How did you know what kind of equipment you needed? Oh man, and that's just been you know the bleeding edge of the learning curve for me because. I'm not a mechanical person. I don't know where the screwdriver is in my house, but I just learned, you know, and, and we, we've sourced the equipment from all over the world. I've got a roaster from Colombia. I've got a refiner from Scotland. I've got other equipment from Ecuador, a temperer from Germany, a, a hundred year old conch from Italy. So it just changed, just come from all over the world. Well, we're going to take our break right now. We'll come back in a couple of moments and talk about the also the, the geography involved here and your interaction with some of the folks around the world as you as you go in search of cocoa and transform it into that wonderful substance we know as chocolate. Back with Sean Ashkenazi in a moment. Ashkenazi chocolate. Don't go away. Back once again talking about this fascinating story of uh, Askinosi uh, chocolate. Sean Askinosi is our guest. Uh, when you mentioned about going down to South America at the very early stage,